Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about today are what are known as space-time diagrams. Um, this is just a way to represent graphically um, the, the motion of things in, in space-time, in space and time, and it's a good way to visualize what the Lorentz transformation is doing to measurements of space and time. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to briefly describe what space-time diagrams are, and then I'll say how you can use them to help you get a handle on the Lorentz transformation. So the basic idea is very simple, it's just a plot where you put position, that's the x-axis, along the horizontal axis of, of the graph, and on the vertical axis you put time. Okay? It's just space measured horizontally, time measured vertically, um, and on these graphs you can plot various different things. Okay? So one thing you could plot is a stationary particle, so suppose I've got a particle somewhere here, x, and if this particle is not moving, then it will just appear as a vertical line on the space-time diagram. So this is a stationary particle. Now if the particle is moving, then obviously its x position will be changing as a function of time, so therefore it is a line with a certain gradient. And the gradient of the line tells you how fast the thing is moving. Okay? If it's nearly vertical, that means it's moving only slowly, which is slow moving. Okay? And, and the steeper the gradient, the faster the particle or whatever is moving. Not the steeper the gradient. So the, the more horizontal the line becomes, which is actually less gradient in the usual sense, means faster. So this particle is moving faster than this one. Um, an accelerating particle, you could have a particle that starts off stationary and then accelerates. So that will appear as a curved line in the space-time diagram. Okay. Okay, so that's what space-time diagrams look like. Um, and you can represent various things on these diagrams. So I just want to do a very simple example um, of a ball falling to the floor. So suppose that I have a ball here, okay, and I drop the ball down, and the ball hits the floor here. So in order to draw this on my space-time diagram, I'm going to take x as being the height of the ball here. Okay? And this ball will have a certain diameter, which we can call d. Okay. So what does this look like on a space-time diagram? Okay. So first of all, let's take the floor to be somewhere here. So everything on this side of the diagram is just in the floor. Okay, and the ball starts off a certain height above the floor. So let's say the ball starts here. And I know that the ball has diameter d, so the ball initially is a interval of x of, of width d here. Okay. Now if we suppose that the ball starts from rest, then initially it will have zero velocity. Um, but because of gravity, it will accelerate, okay, and it has a constant acceleration towards the floor, which will take it down, something like that. Okay, and then, depending upon properties of the ball and the floor, I mean, it could bounce back up like this, or it could just hit the floor and rest, and so on. Okay. So this is the space-time diagram of a ball initially at rest being dropped, and it falls down and it bounces off the floor. Right, so in special relativity, we make a particular choice, which is that we measure the time direction, not just as time in seconds, but as 
c times t, okay, which is actually has units of distance. Okay. So the reason you do this is because that allows you to measure both axes with the same unit, first of all. So I can measure x in meters and ct in meters, for example. The second nice thing about this choice of units here is it means that the speed of light, so a particle moving at the speed of light in this diagram, is then represented as a 45 degree line. So for example, if, if I work in meters and the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, okay? so if I take t as being 1 second, then ct is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters, okay? And the distance it travels, x, is also 3 times 10 to the 8 meters, right? So therefore, so therefore the, the, the distance ct is the same as the distance x, and hence this is a 45 degree line on the diagram. So let me just write that. So in special relativity, uh, the time axis is measured with the units c times t, okay? and this implies that speed of light is a 45 degree line on the diagram. So this is called a light line. The line that taken by light in this diagram. Okay. Right, so that's all I'm going to say about um, Space-time diagrams, that's what they are, and in particular in special relativity, our choice of units such that light is represented as a 45 degree line. Um, and now I want to show you a brief presentation uh, which will explain how we can use these things to understand the Lorentz transformation better. Okay. This can work. Okay, so um, I hope you can see this. So what you see here is a space-time diagram. So you've got the unit, the coordinates x and t on the diagram. And you have a set of points which are measured by an observer. So each of these blue dots on the diagram is a set of points. Um, and you are watching how the measurements of space and time coordinates change as the observer velocity changes. Okay, so you can see down here there's this arrow u is the speed of the observer okay, relative to some unimportant reference frame. And as the speed of observer change, you see that his measurements of space and time change as well. Okay. Now the motion of these points on this diagram are defined by the Lorentz transformation here, these two, x and t. And they have a very important property which you can prove. Um, and that is that if I take a point which has coordinates x and t and I calculate ct squared minus x squared, then this quantity is a constant. That means that different observers, although they will measure different times and space coordinates for this object, will measure the same value of this quantity. So you can prove this, simply take the Lorentz transformations for x and t and plug them in here and you see that this is true. Okay. 
So what this means is that on the space-time diagram, you have a number of fixed lines, okay, which I can indicate here. Okay. So these lines are actually hyperbolas, and each of the points on the space-time diagram moves along these lines. Um, so let me do a very simple example. Suppose that ct squared minus x squared is equal to zero. Okay. So that simply means that x is equal to plus or minus ct. Right? So on the space-time diagram, that's okay. on the space-time diagram, that's going to be a two 45-degree lines which correspond to these light lines. This. Um, and what this condition means is that points which are originally on one of these lines here will remain on one of these lines as you change the observer velocity. So that's the lines there. Now, if you take it not to be zero, but to be something else, so let's call this a squared, okay, then again you can rearrange this to get that x squared is the square root of ct squared minus a squared. Okay? Um, and this will is the equation of hyperbola. Okay? It looks something like this up here, depending on the value of a. Okay? And again, the same thing is true. So if your point starts off on one of the lines here, then it will move along the same line here. Okay, so how can we use these facts to understand the Lorentz transformation better? Okay, so, okay, this slide is just a repetition of what I said. So this quantity, ct squared minus x squared, is a constant, okay? Um, and that means that points on the space-time diagram move along those lines I've indicated. Right, so, I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use this, this picture to explain to you how we can understand the three effects of time dilation, relative simultaneity, and length contraction. Okay. So first of all, the simplest one is time dilation. So here, I've got a stationary clock. So what does a stationary clock look like on a space-time diagram? It's just, it's stationary, that means it's a vertical line, and every second, for example, it ticks. Okay. So here I've represented that stationary clock, and it's ticking once a second. So each of these points is a tick of the clock. Now, if you change the observer velocity, so this clock now appears to be moving, then each of the points here will move along the dashed lines that we've just worked out are constant. Okay? So if I can go to the next slide. Okay. So if I now switch to an observer who is moving in this direction, then he will see the clock going backwards like this, and because these lines are not simply horizontal, but they curve up these, these hyperbola, then you see that the vertical separation between the ticks is increased. Right? So the, the initial separation between two points is, is this much, but from the perspective of the moving observer, there's a larger separation. And this corresponds to time dilation, because what this means is that this is time axis, remember. So this means the top, the clock is ticking more slowly. Okay, so in that way we can understand um, time dilation effect. Okay. Relative simultaneity is also very easy to understand in this picture. Um, so what, is it, what does the effect say? It says that if the stationary observer sees two things happening at the same time, then a moving observer will see one thing happen first and the second thing happens second. Okay. You will see a time difference between the two things. Okay. Um, now again, you can understand this. So here I've chosen the two events to be a red blob and a blue blob on the diagram here. And the stationary observer thinks they happen at the same time, so that means that they are in the same horizontal plane. Now if you switch to a moving observer, if we go back to the original picture here, 
you see that points to, to the left of the observer move up. That's as the observer velocity increases in this direction. Whereas points on the right of the observer move down. So that means in the diagram I've drawn here, this blue blob is going to move up and the red blob is going to move down. Okay, other way around, sorry. The blue blob moves down and the red blob moves up. So wait a minute. Yeah, sorry, the blue one goes down, the red one goes up, that's right, okay. Okay, so therefore the moving observer will see the blue event happen first and the red event happen second, okay? So that's the relative simultaneity. The first observer measures them happening at the same time. The S prime observer sees them happening at different times. Okay, finally length contraction. Um, this is a little bit more tricky. But imagine you've got a stationary ruler or a stationary object of a certain length. So on the space-time diagram, that's represented just as a, a vertical rectangle like this. Right? So this is the length of the object, and it's stationary, so therefore its edges are just straight vertical lines. Now again, we can imagine what does this look like as you change the observer velocity. And I've made an animation of this here. So this is the blue one is the space-time diagram of the same ruler as you change the observer velocity going forward faster up to 0.6 times the speed of light. Okay, So you can see that, first of all, the ruler starts to move this way, as it does relative to the observer. Okay, But you also see that the width of, of the, the horizontal width of the object is shortened. Right. So this width here of the blue line is less than the width of the red line. And this is the length contraction effect. Okay. So the difference in horizontal width between the red line and the blue line is just the effect of length contraction. We can see there. OK, um, a final important point I want to make about um, these space-time diagrams. If you go back to the first slide again, yeah, let's use this one, okay. then you see that you can divide space-time into four regions, right? although in, in three dimensions, this region is actually connected to this region. Um, so it's three regions, really. Um, but in this diagram, it appears to be connected into four separate, divided into four separate regions. And if I take this lower triangular region here, you see that points in this region always remain in this region, right? So if I'm in this lower triangle down here, then regardless of observer velocity, I will remain in this triangle. And the same is true of the triangle up here. Regardless of observer velocity, if you start at a point here in this upper triangle, sorry, then you will remain at a point you will remain in a point on the same triangle. Okay. Now this is, means something physical, because the, the lower triangle consists of points with time less than zero. In other words, points in the past of the observer. And the points in the upper triangle consist of points time greater than zero. In other words, points in the future of the observer. So what this means is that In this diagram, the upper triangle, events which happen here in this area of space-time will appear in the future of any observer regardless of his initial velocity, right? So if I've got an observer who is measuring things at this point here and an event happens somewhere here, then all observers will agree that this thing happened in the future regardless of their of their velocity. Okay. The same thing is true down here. If I've got an event which happened down here, then all observers will agree that all observers who are situated here will agree that this thing happened in the past. Okay. So therefore, these two regions of space-time are called the absolute future and the absolute past. All observers agree that this is the future, and all observers agree that this was the past. Okay. However, 
you have the regions on the side where observers cannot agree. Okay? So I've got an event which happens somewhere in, in one of these gray triangular regions here, and some observers will think that this happens in the future of where they are now, and some observers will think that this already happened, it was in the past. Okay? So we refer to this as the non-causal region. Okay? So it can be in the future and it can be in the past, depending upon the velocity of the observer. So, the existence of, the, of this region has some important consequences um, regarding, uh, regarding motion in special relativity. And in particular, if you allow things to go faster than the speed of light, then you end up with a lot of trouble. Okay, so, I, I want to finally uh, do a brief example to show you some of the trouble you can get into if you allow objects which can travel faster than the speed of light. Okay, so I want to do this using an example on the worksheet. So this is worksheet three, question four I want to look at. Okay, so this question is imagining the following situation. I've got a marksman who is shooting a gun. Gun. And he fires a bullet here. And the bullet goes out of the gun and it hits a target somewhere here. So that's the situation. We've got a guy who fires a gun. And then the bullet hits the target. Okay, so I give you some numbers for this. Um, I say that the distance from the, the gun to the target is 100 meters. So this distance here is 100 meters. Um, and I tell you that the speed of a bullet is a thousand meters per second. So, we can describe this in terms of two events. Event A is the firing of the gun, and the event B is the bullet hitting the target. And what the question asks is, is there a reference frame in which both of these events happen at the same time. So obviously from the perspective of the guy who shoots the gun, the stationary observer, he sees A happen first and then B happen second. Right? He shoots the gun, then the bullet hits the target. But because we know about relative simultaneity, it may be possible that there's a reference frame in which both of these things happen at the same time. Is it possible? Right. So. The answer turns out to be no. Um, there is no reference frame in which these two things happen at the same time. In every reference frame, B happens after A. Uh, and this is because event B lies in the absolute future of event A. So absolute future in the, the sense I just described in terms of the space-time diagrams. Okay. So let's just work out why that's the case. So I can write the coordinates here, X, A, T, A, so that's the point in space and time at which the gun is fired, and I can just take that to be zero. So that's my choice. Then we can take the coordinates here, x, b, t, b, to be, okay, so we know that the target is 100 meters away, and we know the bullet travels at 1,000 meters per second, so therefore it takes 0.1 seconds for the bullet to travel that far, okay? So if we draw this on a space-time diagram, so this is x and this is ct, then we know that the bullet is traveling much, much slower than the speed of light, right? And we know that 
the speed of light is a 45 degree line. So, if I plot the path of the bullet, here's A, it starts at the origin, and the bullet travels along a line something like this. So the point B will be somewhere there. Okay? It's traveling much slower than the speed of light. Therefore, B lies in the absolute future of A, and that means that all observers measure B happen first. Sorry, measure A happen first and B happen second. Right, so as I said, if you allow the existence of bullets which travel faster than the speed of light, then you get into a lot of trouble, right? Because if you allow the existence of bullets which travel faster than the speed of light, then you could have them going along a trajectory like this. So A again is firing the bullet, and the point C here is when the bullet hits the target. But this now, point C, is not in the absolute future of A. So this means that some observers will see the bullet hit the target before it's even been fired. Okay? And, and this is obviously a problem, because we think the reason the bullet hit the target is because the bullet was fired from the gun. Right? In other words, we ascribe a, cause, a causal relationship between these two events. The event A causes event B. Okay? And that means that it should happen before event B. But if we allow the bullet to travel faster than the speed of light, and this is not true for all observers. Okay? Some observers will see, yes, the gun fired first and then the bullet hit the target, but some observers will see the same thing happening in reverse. Right? The bullet hitting the target first, going back, and then going into the gun, which is, which is rather problematic, and it leads to lots of paradoxes, like you know, it allows, it allows time travel, basically. It allows you to go back in time, if you can travel faster than the speed of light. So, this is why this is called the non-causal reason here, because we believe that if an event C happens here, then it cannot have been caused by event A. The two events must be unrelated. Well, they could have been both caused by a, another event further back in time, of course. But event C was not caused by event A. So that's why this is called the non-causal region. And it also suggests very strongly that in special relativity, you can't have objects traveling faster than the speed of light. If we allow objects to travel faster than the speed of light, then we'll end up with lots of crazy stuff. Um, and this turns out to be true. Okay, so as far as we can tell, it is not possible to travel faster than the speed of light. Uh, and in the following weeks, we'll see quite a lot of evidence, both experimental and theoretical, for why this is true why the speed of light is some kind of ultimate speed limit in the universe. It's a speed that you can't exceed. Right, so that's all I'm going to say about the space-time diagrams. So later on in the future weeks, we may well represent some more of the things we're talking about in space-time diagrams as well. It's quite a useful way of thinking about special relativity. Um, but that's all I'm going to say for now. And next, we're going to go and explore some other properties of other properties and consequences of the Lorentz transformations.